Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is going to prove to be very interesting, entitled Preparation for the End Time. And this is the first lesson in that series, entitled The Cosmic Controversy. It's lesson one, of course, in the series for April 7 of 2018. And we hope that you'll be with us through all of these lessons. They'll prove to be very challenging. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as the privilege we consider it to be each time we bow before you and open the scripture and study about you, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, to show us the way to clearly make it plain, plain to those who are listening in. May we come to be more like you as a result of our study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have to start this series by saying that we Seventh-day Adventists are incredibly blessed by all the material that we have available to us about the end of time. Um, there's a fair amount of stuff in the New Testament and a little bit in the Old Testament, but nothing compared to what we have when we add that together with all that Ellen White has written. So we are really blessed, and, and in this series, we should get a, a pretty good idea of that, what, that bless, what that blessing involves. But if we're going to talk about the end of the Great Controversy, it's only fair to talk about the beginning of the Great Controversy. So, how did it begin? Well, this very specific verse about how it began is found in Revelation 12. Interestingly enough, it's in the very last book of the Bible, and we're going to say repeatedly during this time together, and I will say it right now as a beginning, the book of Revelation is pretty, much, pretty difficult to understand, and probably nearly impossible to understand, unless you have a familiarity with the Old Testament already, because they're just re repeated, repeated, repeated references to the Old Testament. Testament, hundreds of them. Well, here we go, Revelation 12, starting with verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there, but how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage, because he knows that he has only a little time left. And I should have started actually in verse 7 to talk about the war itself. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Now we know that the word Michael means the one who is like God, or who is like God, a question. Who fought, so the dragon fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and all his angels with him. So that's the, the one very clear, just in so many words, statement about how the controversy began. But there are some passages in the Old Testament that give some pretty clear ideas about why it began. Let's look at some of those. Um, and of course, we wouldn't have any of this information if it weren't for God's telling it, revealing it to, to his prophets. Um, we know that the great controversy is going to, just as it began, it's going to end. And who's going to win? God's going God's God. to win. The rest of the universe has already been convinced by, by the life and death of Jesus, convinced that God's case has been won. So we're the only ones that are sort of dragging our feet, not sure if we can really trust God or not. So what do we know about how the great controversy began? Well, we've read the passage in Revelation. Look at a few verses in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. I'm going to start with Ezekiel 28, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to me, mortal man, he said, tell the ruler of Tyre that what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying to him, puffed up with pride, you claim to be a god. 
You say that like a god, you sit on a throne surrounded by the seas. You may pretend to be a god, but no, you are mortal, not divine. And following that, the verses 11 to 17, the Lord spoke to me again. Mortal man, he said, grieve for the fate that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You were once an example of perfection. How wise and handsome you were. You lived in Eden, the garden of God, and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, carnelian and jasper, sapphires, emeralds, and garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain and walked among sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. You were busy buying and selling, and this led you to violence and sin. So I forced you to leave my holy mountain, and the angel who guarded you drove you away from the sparkling gems. You were proud of being handsome, and your fame made you act like a fool. Because of this, I hurled you to the ground and left you as a warning to other kings. Now, for those who aren't so familiar with these passages, what we have here is a case of God speaking to an earthly king, but speaking not just to him, he's also speaking to the power which is behind him, and that, of course, we believe is Satan. Look at another example found in Isaiah 14. So what would be the indications that you would do a double meaning like that? Well, uh, the fact that he talks to, uh, he addresses him as the king of Tyre. Yeah. Okay. But then he talks about you walked about in the Garden of Eden. Okay. So the, the king of Tyre. Huh? And you were perfect. And the stones of along the stones of fire. Yeah, too. you walked in the stones of fire. So none of those things can apply to the king of Tyre. But if he was talking to the king of Tyre, well, then how how would that make any sense to him? Well. And, and that's, of course, a challenge for us as Bible readers to sort out what's talking about this person and what's talking about the one. And there are lots of other examples. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, is the prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14 that talks about, you know, a virgin shall bring forth a, a child in the King James. And uh, actually, uh, the word in the original Hebrew is not virgin. It's, it's young woman of marriageable age. And if you read chapter 8, you realize it's really talking about Isaiah's baby. But then when you get to chapter 9, it says, you are what? Everlasting Father, oh, wonderful, wonderful Counselor, Prince, Prince of, of Peace. Peace. That's, not, that's not Isaiah's child. There's no way it can be Isaiah's child. So here we have another case of, here's something here, but it's a, an example. And they're both, by the way, in that context, are called Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, I was just wondering when it gets applied to the the earthly side and those phrases come up, well, then what would they think? Yeah, well, it was a good question, fair question. Mm -hmm. I, of course, the king of Tyre was, well, both of them really almost claimed to be gods. So let's look at this one, Isaiah 14, starting with verse 12. King of Babylonia. Bright morning star, and by the way, that word bright morning star is a Lucifer. translation. It's phosphorus in Greek, but it's Lucifer in Latin. in Latin. You have fallen from heaven in the past. Now, you know, there's no way the king of Babylon could claim that he fell from heaven. In the past, you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on the mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty, but instead you have been brought down to the deep, deepest part of the world of the dead. So those are the clearest passages in Scripture about the beginning of the great controversy. Um, does anybody else have a comment about that that uh, might help to clarify things? Gary's comments were fair. Well, you could put in uh, Psalms 82, and you could put Deuteronomy 32, yeah. uh, 8 and 9, uh, where, and they're explaining where the sources of, of the, uh, these philosophies, these religions. Because if you think about it, where did these where religions come from? Did the people on their own conjure up? No, God has given freedom on the part of those heavenly intelligences that were ref referenced back there in uh, Revelation 12 to 
tell their side of the story. Just like the book of Job, you got four guys telling, well, and then you got Satan, uh, telling the opposite, basically, of what uh, Job and, and, and God was telling. So God is for freedom of sell your peace and see, see who buys it. Um, okay. So what actually happened in heaven? Unless First of all, we have to understand that God did not make a mistake when he made Lucifer. He was a perfect being. There's no, no way you can blame God for any part of that, except one aspect, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, God is love. That's the answer as to why there is evil. Because without the freedom to make a choice, you don't <laughs> have love. Love is impossible without free will. I think you've got a great quote on that for us, Gary. I'm, I'm sorry, Carrie. Yes. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough <laughs> may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in Scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin, that there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government that gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. <coughs> to excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God. It is the, quote, transgression of the law, unquote. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. That comes from Great Controversy, paragraph 2, page 492, through the whole of 493 page. Okay. <clears throat> so that gives us a clue. Um, we believe and we're told that uh, this Lucifer that used to be, well, you, Lucifer, Satan, who used to be Lucifer, stood next to God's throne. And I just, every time I think about that, it just blows me away to think that here's a person standing next to God himself with all the revealed evidence he has in front of him, decides to rebel. I mean, it just blows me away. Can you explain something that it can't be explained? Okay, try. No, I mean, Probably not. that's how it, it says it's impossible to explain what yeah. the origin of sin. I can't. So, how does that blow your mind? Well, because it's, it was so foolish. It was just completely ridiculous for Sam to do such a thing. So it's, the answer is foolish. Well, he was a created being. How could he be better than God or equal, even equal? Yeah, but, uh, I guess my point is that we're trying to explain it here. Well, yeah, well really, what we... can't explain it. <laughs> what we really have is, is probably is uh, Michael was the physical manifestation of God, because mm -hmm. Jesus said there in John uh, 1, 18 and 6, 46, nobody has seen God except the one, or seen the Father except the, for the one that came from the Father. So our understanding is that Michael, the one who is like God, uh, is a physical or the, something that they can perceive in time and space. And uh, um, that's, it's, he, there was non-threatening. When Jesus was here, he was not threatening. Yeah. Never, never, uh, never advocated killing. Uh, didn't kill. And uh, it's... Uh, we think of <coughs> Jesus as Emmanuel coming God to us, us, God with us. But mm -hmm. in terms of his pre-existence as Michael, you could always also think of him as Emmanuel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a, the, he, and of course, that uh, uh, January 20, 1890, Sons of the Times sort of thing, he physically presented himself, but then, when, then he leaves, and he leaves the rest of humanity to tell a story about him. He doesn't impose, doesn't stand off in the corner, doesn't remind you, hey, or bellow from, or, or put the Ten Commandments on the wall, or the, or the, uh, just, uh, 
well, the freedom with which we've been uh, Of course, blessed. let's be very clear. Love is impossible without freedom. Absolutely. So God says, I'm sorry, I cannot create any kind of creatures without giving, unless I give them freedom. And that freedom makes it possible for someone to rebel. So in the sense, God made sin possible, but it was, he wasn't in any way responsible for it. For those of you who are familiar with the writings of Ellen White, there are three chapters that just fantastic on this that, that I would encourage you to read. One's entitled The Origin of Evil, in Great Controversy, pages 492 to 504. The other one, next one is Why Was Sin Permitted in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 33 to 43. And the last one is talks about how sin came to this earth, entitled The Temptation and Fall in Patriarchs and Prophets, 52 to 62. So if you have an opportunity to read those passages, those, those chapters, you'll give a much clearer and much broader uh, understanding of, of, of what was going on uh, in, back there in, in those circumstances. That uh, great controversy, chapter 29, I believe it is, the most important chapter of any book I've ever read, and that's mm -hmm. basically the, the prism or the filter with which I've read everything in, 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 in life. Yeah. It comes to that one chapter. So, and if you want help from us, uh, these materials that we use, that we prepare for our discussion here together are available at our website. That's th theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you'll get the material that we look at here. So, here's a question for you to think about. When did Eve first start sinning? Was it when she wandered away from Adam? Was it when she either by accident or on purpose got close to the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Was it when she started talking to the serpent? Was it when she took the fruit? Was it when she bit the fruit? Anybody have any insights, any divine insights? You're kind of assuming that something will lead to another thing. On it that. seemed to do that, didn't it? Yeah. So, um, if you put put that put it that way, God is the one that put put him in put the tree in the middle of the garden. He did. So that yeah. lead led to her going to it because it's in the middle of the garden, and then everything starts. Okay. Going was, like that. Was the tree a temptation or was it a protection? I view, uh, and I think Ken has a whole handout on that the tree was actually where the Satan was confined. He wasn't a, able to wander throughout right the in garden. The middle of the of the whole thing. He has to give it's Satan a chance. I mean, it's just like this table is is Eden, and you put him right there, right, right in the middle, yeah. smack in the middle. You can get away from the center of the table. You can yeah, get away but from you're, you're going to be walking around the corners <laughs> here. You're not going to go over there. There might be a. I don't think the real don't have size enough. is correct. Well, the shape is though. <laughs> don't yeah, know well, that <laughs> either. <laughs> the tree of life was there, so why would you why would you leave the tree of life and and eat something from the tree of knowledge of good and evil when you had very specific instructions not to do that? Well, so we want to put in the argument that is, this earth was created to answer the questions that these have other heavenly intelligences already had. He had to, to answer their questions, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's why he created uh, this earth. And uh, Well, let, let, let me add, put your point with Gordon's point. Obviously, Satan was already around. Right. So when God created a new earth with new creature, Satan demanded that he have access to them. And God says, okay, you get one tree right here. He didn't put it clear somewhere in the far corners where they would never ever see it. He said, they're there. If, if, they, if they want to go to your tree, they can go to your tree. But it's kind uh, of like an infection, you know? Yeah. You don't have to overwhelm the whole body. You just get uh, what, one little pinprick of, of, of HIV and, and if it, down the stream, you, you run the really risk. What's interesting about this, though, is that God threw him to the earth, right? The earth well, is here, what, he threw him to the earth, and then right underneath him, he creates the earth. Yeah. So, 
in a way, the Lord was kind of taunting him. Is that figuratively threw him to the earth or physically? I think it's... I, more, I think it's more figuratively and I think probably translation Well, what, the, what would it mean then if it was figuratively? Because well, it, no, one, no one anywhere else in the universe would pay attention to him. They said, we know what you're up to. We don't want anything to do with you. Okay, so he throws him on the earth and then God creates the earth right under his feet. That's right. So that's, yeah, okay. Well, so that's, that's kind of interesting. You need to, you need to read very carefully the, what I, the section I suggested in, in Ellen White. She seems to suggest that he was thrown down to this earth well, it, before the war started in heaven. Part of the reason the war started in heaven is because God announced that he was, go, he was getting ready to make a new earth and he's going to put some new people there. And Satan wanted to be part of the council that, that made those decisions. God says, you have nothing to contribute. And it made him angry. Okay, and then just because of that, I'm going to throw you to the earth, and I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to well, if you if you if you crazy. you want to talk about something really crazy, we're going to look at in a moment. God wins the great controversy by sending a baby boy right into the middle of Satan's kingdom. How about that one? Just one baby. One little baby boy. Just one interjection. Um, Adam and Eve and the tree, the most important thing that I get out of that is remember that Lucifer lies. He will tell any lie that he can to get you to question God, think God is maybe possibly wrong or missed something, um, and he's beautiful, he looks good, smells good, and he's touching all the bad stuff and nothing is happening to him. And that happens today to our young people, to us, and in this world. So mm -hmm. just remember, the devil is a liar. Mm -hmm. I think more, another way of saying it would be he's a deceiver. He takes the lie and sugarcoats it oh, there to you make go. it palatable. So as deception is really, is what's a, the whole thing is infected with deception. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks good, you know, logic is there, but the problem is you've been missing some part of the elements that yes. are very important. Deception, the deceiver of the whole world, Revelation uh, yes, 12. Uh, 12. This is a good thing to know from hindsight, but um, yeah. what about Eve? Well, okay, and I'm going to oh, talk about that. Okay. Ellen White again says that he, they were clearly instructed by the Father, by the Son, and by the angels who visited them daily. They were warned about that tree. And what would make her think that they were superior and that they ought to be followed. I wasn't there. I'm just... Well, you just you just said that for a reason. I'm countering that. They, so they, how do you deal well, with that? Well, they knew that God was the creator. They did? Yes. How would you know that? Well, I Adam... I mean, you just, you just come into being and all of a sudden he's there. No. You come into being and then you look, you start naming animals and you can't find a wife. No, that doesn't... Uh, Hold when on. When it comes into being, He's just there. The angels are just there. Yeah. And now this other guy comes, and these guys told him, don't listen to this guy. Well, why not? Just, just do what I say. Don't listen to this guy. No, no, God There's doesn't operate like that. that. He, I'm sure he made a lot of explanations. <clears throat> yeah, but it isn't in the Bible. It isn't in the no. Scripture. It I, just says, I, I it just says stay it. away from that tree. Mm -hmm. Stay away. And that, that's it. So you're putting all this other stuff in when, there. Okay, I'm going to ask. You had, when your son was two years old, did you, did you give all sorts of explanations why not to go out in the street? Or did you say, don't but go in the street? I did it anyway if I didn't grab him and that's pull right. him back. Yeah. Well, God didn't grab her and say, hey, you're too close to that tree and pulled him back. Yeah, well, that's because God allows freedom and you don't. Well, I, it's a good thing I didn't do it to my son because yeah. he would have ran out in the street. Okay, now, here's, uh, let me take your point, and let me ask you a question. What do you think was going through Eve's mind as she took the fruit? She heard the serpent say, you will not surely die. She'd already set herself up when she said, don't touch it, or, mm -hmm. uh, not to touch it. So she, she was already... <laughs> Right next. And probably there wasn't anything, nothing, no electric shock go through her with the, with the touching. Mm -hmm. So, and, they got, and the other, the serpent is, is eating it, apparently. It's uh, well, what, what logic. What do you think went through her head when, when she did that? How did she know what death was? 
How did she know well, what that and, means? And all to those God. things we have only speculation. Uh, but my my thinking is that God was not. I mean, he, he's the kind of a loving father, and he would not allow them to be tempted. She's, the Bible says that more than they were able to bear. So I I have to believe that God said. You know, here's the reason. Mm -hmm. You don't understand it. Nobody has ever died, as far as we know, in the entire universe so far, yeah. which is completely contrary to evolutional theory, evolutionist theory. But, uh, you know, if you, if you touch this, if you eat it, this is what's going to happen. And I'm sure he could explain that a lot better than I can. I just don't know how he did it. Well, verse 6 of chapter 3 of Genesis says, And when the women saw, in other things, things looked good. Uh, the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one, one wise. And those three things are paralleled in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, both the full pride of life, mm -hmm. the temptations that Jesus uh, experienced so that he could be tempted in all points like as we are. So okay. Satan took those things which were good and perverted, uh, and, and sh in other words, sugar-coated, as Jim okay. said, yeah. with yeah. the good things. It looked good. Yep. Uh, and uh, but then there was the lie desirable to make one wise yeah uh, going outside of God to get wisdom is is uh, not a good idea no it's uh, satanic as the okay. <laughs> well I, I really agree with that right now with all the history you got with the Bible we got to study and all that stuff that we've we've experienced but Putting my putting my mind into what she understood at that time, it's a little bit harder to know yeah. whether or not she actually could have understood that to, so to go against it. Her mind was a lot she, better than ours. But what she did have was <laughs> well, the personal presence of God and yeah. interacting with God on a daily basis, and uh, what his manifestation that? of love and and care and and all of those things. Well, yeah, but. You just told me something I don't know. Well, I'll tell you, you just, you're just telling me a bunch of stuff that, okay. Okay, yeah. Gary, I've, I've got this one for you, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to jump in here, okay? <laughs> so why do you sin? So why do I sin? Yeah, you have all the evidence. We give ourselves permission. Well, wasn't, wasn't she supposed to be perfect? I'm not perfect right now, but wasn't so she supposed true. to be perfect before yeah, she... So with free choice. With free choice? Mm -hmm. and st yeah. Well, then if free choice <laughs> makes you, you have sin, well, then no, it, it can happen forever. No, free choice is not a, something that causes, or, the make causes the problem. It, it's more the, the playing field. There's, it's it's playing something field else. that it allows it to happen. Jesus it allows it, but it doesn't said drive it. Made her. That I isn't shouldn't. it, but that is the avenue that it came through. The the freedom, wouldn't you well, say? Yes, but then you couldn't have uh, love either. Okay. Well, our, our time is running on. We still have other things to talk about. So <laughs> let's let, let's move on. Okay. So Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They were ushered out of the garden. And what happened next? Satan claimed this entire world as his territory. Yeah. And the Bible recognizes that he's the prince of this world and all that kind of stuff. He's a prince of peace, the son, one of the son of perdition, son of perdition and yeah. uh, evil spirit. Mm -hmm. He's a trinity in himself. <laughs> okay, so l let's, let's just take a, an eagle's eye view of the great controversy for a moment. The very first battle between Satan and Christ, when did it happen and what was the result? Are you talking about the wilderness experience? No, uh, I, I, I mean, said, Satan oh, tried uh, to get him at, at... I did not say Jesus, I said Christ. The very first was uh, obviously in heaven. Okay. At the very, you know, as Satan, as Lucifer conceived of this, of, of rebellion and Diabolical tried to plot. convince the angels and... Uh, there was a conflict. There was a verbal conflict, a discussion, mm -hmm. and eventually Satan and uh, so, a third of the angels were no longer welcome. Okay, so who won the first battle? 
Jesus, God. Okay. So next, we, we come down now, and there, I'm not talking about all the end, things in between. The next major battle happened when Christ came to this earth. The, the field of temptation, the, the, the temptations in the wilderness, who won that battle? Christ. Jesus. Christ. Won again. On the cross, did Jesus win or did he lose? He won. He won. You win by dying. Well, Sounds like a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Well, the death was, when was, he resurrected, uh, then the it, real, everybody knew. The real victory came when he rose from the death yes. in his own power. Yes. So, and some people have questions about that. For those of you out there that want, not sure about that, Desire of Ages, 785, the second paragraph. You need to look at that very carefully. Okay, so what happens next? According to Revelation, the devil declares war on all of Christ's followers that came to be called Christians. Now, in the history of our world so far, who does it look like is winning? Looks like Satan is winning. It looks like Satan. If you would just, just, had to, just a quick overall view from what happened from the time of, of Christ to our day, you would say it looks like Satan's winning. If you go by numbers of numbers. humans. Yeah. There are many more humans on Satan's side than on God's side. So now we're coming down to the end of time. That's what we're talking about here. Who's going to win the final battle? Jesus is. Jesus will. Christ. That's what Revelation says. Are we able to be a part of that winning side? By faith. So who are the, who are the combatants in this war? Let's be very clear. It's not somehow some two equal gods somewhere battling it out. No, we're talking about someone who knows that they are a creature raising a battle, starting a war against their creator. The one they know keeps them alive every minute. Again, to me that just is, is you couldn't be more foolish than that. Well, anyway, as we have stated repeated, the great controversy is over who is telling us the truth. Is Satan's selfishness-based government better, or is God's love-based government better? Paul tells us we may, be, we may all be liars, and of course we know who the original liar was, but we may all be liars, but God must always tell the truth. And Dennis, I think you have some verses about that. Right. Romans 3, 1 to 4. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed, in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Now, who's um, being tried? Good News Bible. God. God's being tried. Now, most of our w friends, even our Christian friends, <clears throat> haven't come to grips with that question. They think the whole great controversy is somehow about how God saves you and me. No, the great controversy is about God and whether he's won in the great controversy, whether he's given us sufficient convincing evidence that he's telling us the truth. Because if God is a, some kind of a liar, if he's vicious, if he's a tyrant, as Satan claims, who would want to be saved? Um, well, Satan was certain, I'm sure, I mean, he must have gloated when Jesus was born as a baby boy. Because how many people had lived a perfect life on earth up to that point? Zero. 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 Not a single person. And so he said, this little boy, <laughs> I'm going to keep my eyes focused on him. We're going to bring him down. Well, did he succeed? No. no. So, he, so he, he comes then to that critical moment there. Jesus has fasted for 40 days. And, and Satan realizes that he's so weak that he's about to collapse. And he says, this is my chance. And did he succeed? No. Then there was the Calvary story. 
just jumping over real care real quickly. It looked like Satan won in that in that situation, but who won? Jesus won again. Do you think Satan is a little bit uneasy about the fact that he keeps losing? The devils believe and tremble. <laughs> Well, again, too, look at it from his point of view. Well, I've only lost a few battles, yeah. but they're the key battles, mm -hmm. the key conflicts. Well, what is it? What is it you judge by that he's won or lost a battle? You tell me. What would you judge by? Well, I'm asking you because you're the one that says okay. that he's lost so many. Okay, we well, got thrown out of heaven. Would you call that a win or a loss? Well, he's still still alive. Well, he's still <coughs> he's still in God's you could, creation. You could, you could fight a battle and then end up being a slave somewhere. You're still alive, but you wouldn't call that winning. Yeah, but think of all the sympathy he might be getting because he's thrown on the on the um, the planet there. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's any people very many people. What I'm get, saying is that, that there's thing. no definite ending point that says you lost. Ha ha ha. Nobody's laughing. There's still well, you know what I mean. You know what I mean, but there's there's um, there's still a possibility there. It's, well, is yeah, he doesn't he's, lose until he's gone. He's insane enough to think there's still a possibility. Yeah. Well, how successful has Satan been at working against God's people? Unfortunately, he's been pretty successful. Look, think of all the ones who've been killed, all the martyrs, et cetera, et cetera, and now. He, he, he ends up with this, a world full of apostate Christians. Well, there was a prophetic period. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it right now, but there's a prophetic period spoken about in Daniel and in Revelation numerous times. Sometimes it's called 42 months. Sometimes it's called three and a half years. Sometimes it's called 1260 days. But whatever you choose to call it, it's a period which we believe, uh, based on the prophecies and the context, started around 538 A.D. and ended in 1798. And what happened in 1798? The French got rid of the Pope for a while. Yeah, they said, uh, basically, uh, Napoleon said, I'm tired of this guy being critical. He sent him down there, he arrested the Pope, and within the year the Pope was dead. And he said, okay, we got that taken care of. And Revelation talks about a deadly wound, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the de deadly wound was healed. Jackie, I think you have the next quote there. All righty. These persecutions, beginning under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheaters. Wow. Great controversy. Page 40. Wow. Well, so, does Satan think he's, think he's winning now with the successes he's had against God's people? I, I, I think that he, well, he knows that he's lost, but mm. he wants to take you with him and me with them because you are the apple of God's eye. We all each are the center of his love and care. So what greater, uh, I gotcha, mm -hmm. than to take away your favorite thing. Yeah. So. Well, Matthew 28, 20 tells us that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are looking out after all of us. And Romans 8 goes into that in great depth, chapter, uh, verses 31 to 39. We don't have time to... Uh, let me read just a couple of those verses to, to give us, to emphasize what Jackie just said. I'm going to start with verse um, 36, well, actually 37, no, 37. No, in the, all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us. Gary, here's your war. 
For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a pretty powerful statement, I'd say. Yes. So, um, despite all that, Christians have been killed. They have suffered pain, trials, every kind of persecution you can imagine. Look at 2 Timothy 4.8. And now there is waiting for me the victory. I mean, when was 2 <clears throat> Timothy written? Near the end of Paul's life, I think. He's believe. in prison in Rome. He's waiting. In, he knows that any day a soldier could walk in and say, Nero has declared it's time for you to die. And he's writing these words. And now there is waiting for me the victory prize of being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who wait with love for him to appear. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't too much question in Paul's mind, was there? He knew, I mean, Paul knew what was coming, didn't he? Seventh-day Adventists have an unusual name. We have this name, Seventh Day, which implies that we worship on Saturday, the, the, the final day in the week. And then we go by the name Adventist. What does Adventist mean? And by that way, I should say, along with the Seventh Day thing, we believe that all of the Ten Commandments should, are still in force and, and should be followed. And what about Adventist? The soon coming of, of, of God. Yeah. We believe in the advent of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, well, in, in, in Romans I'm, and other places, I, Jeremiah 44, 23, Romans 3, 22, 26, Romans 7, 7, uh, there are places, and I'm going to focus on just a few. Romans 3, 1 to 4 that Dennis already read for us, and Romans 3, 25 and 26. I'm going to read that now. Notice very carefully who's doing what. God offered him so that by his blood, that's God offering Jesus, by his blood we should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven. Through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past he was patient and overlooked people's sins. But in the present time, he deals with his sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. And this guy, in this way, God shows that he himself is righteous. Oh, and by the way, and that he puts right everyone who believe in Jesus. So why would God say three times that this death of Christ, the life and death of Christ, says, teaches us that God is righteous first, and then he says, oh yes, and, and I can make you righteous too. Why is that? Why did he ask Peter yeah. three times? Well, we're going we're gonna to focus on the fact that we believe that the great controversy is over the truth about God, his government, and his character. Mm -hmm. So he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what's necessary to make the truth about myself and my government plain to as many people as possible. Well, is it hard to understand any of those verses that we've read so far? Or is the English difficult? No? Well, There's I, always more to learn. Yeah. I enough. would just say to people that are studying and have questions that it says in the Bible that God's ways are a mystery to us. Without the Holy Spirit to bring us understanding, spiritual eyesight, Mm -hmm. So, if you're having trouble studying this stuff, pray that God will send you the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and give you understanding, and He will. He promises to. Well, we are given a promise, both in the Bible and again in the writings of Ellen White, that the peace and wonderful fellowship that was a part of the world before Satan got involved, and, and the universe for that matter, before Satan got involved, is going to come back again someday. 
And Gary, I think you've got a statement about that. <clears throat> so long as all the created beings acknowledge the allegiance of love, there, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly hosts to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and show forth his praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies, but a change came over this happy state. There was one who perverted the freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been the most honored of God and was highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Lucifer, son of the morning, was the first of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. He stood in the presence of the great creator and the ceaseless being beams of glory enshrouded the eternal God rested upon him. Thus saith the Lord, Thou th sealest up the sum, sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the great, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set, said thee so. Thou wast upon the, the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down the, the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect thou <laughs> thy ways, in thy ways from the day that thou hast, was created till iniquity was found in thee. Okay, and that last section was, of course, to Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, but the entire passage is found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 35, first paragraph. It's hard to say those these and vows. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> At least for me. <laughs> well, we as Seventh-day Adventists have been blessed with more prophetic material, more truth as revealed in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, than any other people in history. Are we making appropriate use for the, of this gold mine of truth? If we're willing to read carefully not only the biblical passages, but also the appropriate materials from Ellen White, we must agree that the conflict is not about us or, or even our salvation, as important as, to us as that is. The conflict is about who is telling us the truth, God or Satan. And basically, when we're talking about who's telling the truth, what, what are we talking about? Who can we trust, right? Who can we trust? The conflict did not even start here on earth. It began in heaven. Who can be trusted with our eternal well-being? How should that impact us? Only God is that trustworthy. Well, what about it? Do we want to be a part of God's vast universe and live in agreement with his law of love? Or do we want to persist in our selfishness and join the rebels? What about that? Do we understand clearly what the implications of our choices will be? How many people out there living their lives every day in, in 2018 have any idea of the implications of what they're doing? Well. Well, isn't that part of how Satan grabs them? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have no idea, and then when, when life starts turning on them, who do they blame? They start blaming God, mm -hmm. when they haven't even followed his way in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think yep. that's his, his motive, Satan, is just to get you to do things that are against the truth, and the truth will come back at them, and then they'll blame God for it. 
I would like to challenge all of us, myself in, included, and you out there, to try living your life a little closer to Jesus Christ and see if it goes any better. Now, Satan is not going to like it. He's going to do everything he possibly can to make things miserable for you. But the best life of all is when we live closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. Do the passages in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that we read earlier raise any questions in your mind? While we cannot possibly give any explanation for the origin of evil, do we have a pretty clear picture about how it actually happened? What Satan did? Ellen White one place says he really thought for a while that he would be able to convince every single angel in heaven to join his side. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, again, I cannot believe. I mean, and these are the, I mean, these massive intelligences, they're very smart people living in the presence of God, and somehow or other Lucifer manages to deceive them. Well, no wonder the Bible calls it the mystery of iniquity, right? 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. So what actually happened when there was war in heaven? We've talked about it briefly. Did they fight with guns and military equipment? We don't know. What would happen if you tried to shoot God with a gun? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. It would burn up before it got to you. You think you could shoot Satan with a gun? No. No. But he created them. He could have stamped them out any which way. Yeah? Well, it was a lot of whispering of lies and backroom deals and, uh, I mean, a third of the angels. That's considerable. And it wasn't done out and open for a long time. It was just... So why does God allow sin to continue? God is love. Who's, who's keeping sin going? <clears throat> Well, if the natural, res the natural result of evil left to run its own course will end in death. Mm -hmm. So who's keeping sin alive? The only one who can give life. That's right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds kind of incongruous, but the fact remains, until evil is fully demonstrated, been permitted to fully demonstrate its, its wares. Gordon, I think you have a statement about that. From Desire of Ages 759. God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth, but he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's let, government. Let me interrupt for a second. God does not win by overcome, over, does not overcome with force. Mm -hmm. So what does that have to do with the war in heaven? Everything. Because it was persuasion. Okay, go ahead. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral, and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. God so, cannot intimidate and persuade at the same time. We can't do it. Antagonize. And God can't do it either. So right. God, to, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, part of what, you know, what love does is it creates loving relationships. And if that's a, somewhat a picture of heaven, then the war would result in uh, breaking up those relationships mm -hmm. and God would withdraw from those others. So it would be sort of the opposite of the fellowship that existed before, just as Romans 1, I think it is, says God gave them over. God gave them up them to. Let them go, in other right. He lets them go. So there's this uh, giving up and not, and as opposed to the, the normal loving fl uh, what, what flow kind of relationship. What kind of power threw Satan to, to the earth? What kind of power did that? Well, there's a possibility, which I think is probably likely, that he ended up at this earth because Nobody else was will, was willing to to accept. So it. he he came down on his free will. You think so? I think I think I mean, there was no sound like no that. place else for him to go. How do you get how do you get thrown to heaven? That's what it says in Revelation. Thrown down to earth. Thrown down to earth. Yeah. 
We'll find out someday. If you reread, <laughs> you did that, well, or maybe. Well, the, the uh, you know, he was thrown out of heaven and he came to Eden, uh, but he had no status there until he he wrested it from Adam. So from then on, he could go, as we see in Job, to the the well, when when they came together. It was I think Revelation is talking about when Jesus died on the cross. There was this. Also, uh, yeah. he could know now. Jesus has rested back the control of this earth. Okay. He's he's the ruler. We're running out of time. I'd like to make oh. a couple more points before we finish up completely. <laughs> Incredible. We mentioned this before, but God chooses to win the great controversy by sending a baby boy right into the middle of Satan's kingdom. That just is really something. So, God has said. Let's be clear that sin leads to death. Satan says, oh no, that's a lie. And he's been trying to make that clear, trying to get people to, to believe that. Uh, God has repeatedly won in the battle. Uh, the life and death of Jesus answered Satan's accusations and his questions right down to the point where Jesus rose from the dead on his own power. And I, I'm sure God didn't do this, but he could have turned to Satan and said, okay, if you think you're equal to Jesus, try dying and coming back to life. I, that's what I would have said. <laughs> oh, I didn't taunt Satan. Oh, my word. Yeah, okay. Oh. Well, so we learned a few things. The great controversy began in heaven. It involves the entire universe, not just our little world. The really important questions are about who is who is telling us the truth? Can God be trusted with our eternal salvation? Or is he, as Satan claims, a capricious, vengeful tyrant? And since God is determined to make his case very clear and transparent, all we have to do is study the evidence, believe it, and act on it. That's all that's necessary. So can God be trusted? Satan's case is based on lies and deceit. He's doing everything possible to confuse us, to, discover, to deceive us. And everything that God does, has, God does has to be open and transparent. So that's our choice. Do we want to be a part of an open, transparent, free universe, or do we want to be a part of a deceptive one? Our kind and loving Father, the choice is put in our court. We can make that choice. We can do what's right. We can choose to become a part of your kingdom. And we know that you've already won. Why would we choose to, to be a part of the losing side? So now we challenge not only ourselves, but all those who are listening to make the right choice in the great controversy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.